Welcome to the FEG Insight Bridge. This is Greg Dowling, Head of Research and CIO at FEG. This show spans global markets and institutional investments through conversations with some of the world's leading investment, economic, and philanthropic minds to provide insight on how institutional investors can survive and even thrive in the world of markets and finance. FEG's Approachable Asia 2020 event was originally scheduled for this fall in Singapore. It is an event where we take a handful of our clients for boardroom style education and to meet with local managers. Well, that was the plan before the coronavirus pandemic hit. The good news is that through a series of podcasts, you can receive the same content and get to skip the 16 hour flight. While we often mistake the ASEAN region as a series of small island countries sandwiched somewhere between India and China, that's a big mistake. As a region, they have a larger population than both the United States and the EU. Also, their combined economic impact is already large and growing. Today on the Insight Bridge, we will chat with an ASEAN expert, James Johnstone of RWC. James co-manages RWC's Emerging Markets and Frontier teams. He has spent years investing in this region and others. We will focus on the current opportunities and what makes this region different than other emerging markets. James, welcome to the FEG Insight Bridge. Nice to be here, Greg. Thanks very much for having me. Would you uh, please briefly introduce yourself and your firm? James Johnson, yes, I've been working uh, in emerging markets now for about 25 years, so I do feel like I've served my time. I joined Schroeder's in 1995, having been in the, in the Royal Navy, so I'd sailed the seven seas and seen quite a lot of the world, uh, and thought it was time to, to kind of invest in these new Asian markets which were developing after I'd spent some time in Hong Kong. Over 25 years, we've obviously seen huge changes in the emerging markets. I've moved a couple of jobs, but we landed up at RWC in 2015, my partner, John Malloy, and myself. Uh, we now run about $9 billion in the emerging markets, and we've got a, another focus as well on the next generation of markets uh, and frontier markets. So it's uh, a big team, and we do a lot of traveling. So for many people, these are just a bunch of islands somewhere between China and India. Why should investors care? Give us some stats. Well, it's a great question. And I think, of course, they should care. So I'll just give you two stats to start. One is the US Chamber of Commerce in China did a survey of their members in mid-2019, so pre-virus. But they did a survey of their members. And the question was, what percentage of you are thinking of increasing or decreasing your investments in China? And 50% said they were thinking of increasing their investments outside of China. And as the follow-up, where are you putting those investments? Another half of them, so 25% of all the respondents said, we're looking at ASEAN. So they care. So I think we should care. And just for your listeners, anyone who's been to a Red Lobster, that's owned by a Thai company. Anyone who's drank a Chang beer recently, again, a Thai company. Anyone who has a Smash Burger recently, bought by a Filipino fast food company about two years ago. Anyone who's drunk a Red Bull, Thai energy drink. Anyone who's ever stayed in an Anantara or an NH hotel on their travels around the world, again, Thai company. Anyone had a coffee in Dina and DeLuca, again, owned by an ASEAN company. So there's a lot of ways that ASEAN has influence across the world, which we just might not know about. And I think it's a really important part that ASEAN is a really big, important economic block. feel like the way that most people have played the ASEAN region is through the consumer. Maybe talk a little bit how, how the ASEAN consumer is different than just the mainland Asian consumer. Sure. Well, I thought I'd give a little bit of history on ASEAN, just to kind of put it in context, what are we talking about? So ASEAN, as you know, is the Association of Southeast Nations. It was founded in 1967, and there are 10 countries today, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, Malay- uh, Singapore, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. So let's think, if that was a single country, that would be the fifth largest GDP in the world with an economy the size of 3.2 trillion, with a 650 million strong population, the consumer you're talking about, and with consumption expenditure today of $1.8 trillion. So before we look at how the consumers work, let's just think how this success story happened. So post the Second World War, obviously Korea and Japan are the two most obvious uh, economic recovery stories that we know about. But Singapore also has to be up in the kind of pantheon of the best success stories of the last 50 years. It's risen from a small trading outpost where British armed forces were nearly 40% of GDP in the 1960s to be one of the richest countries in the world today with a GDP per capita of 70,000. And 
And I would recommend anyone who's interested to read Lee Crown Yu's autobiography, um, which really is one of the most incredible reads uh, to understand that progress. It's almost the playbook of how to be frontier to developed in 50 years. But so these original ASEAN tigers, before we talk about China, let's not forget China really didn't play any role in the global economy up until about 2000. So really the ASEAN tigers took on that manufacturing success story from Japan as a result of Japanese capital. Japan wanted to find uh, somewhere to invest its excess capital. It wanted to have lower cost manufacturing. It wanted to find a new outlet for some of its consumer goods. It obviously began to invest into Thailand and Malaysia. Toyota famously founded a huge part of the auto industry in Thailand. And then let's think, Intel, Western Digital, these are the biggest manufacturers that moved to Malaysia and Singapore. 75% of the world's hard drives were made in Malaysia and Singapore in the, in the 80s and even up until the 90s. So then obviously China turns up in the WTO in the early 2000s and suddenly we have this incredible manufacturing miracle. We've lifted 750 million people out of poverty because of the low cost of, of labor that China gave on offer to, to global industry. Um, and that's obviously been a phenomenal success, but we should never forget that ASEAN was there first and ASEAN in the background has bubbled away. We've now got this large economic block, as I say, $3.2 trillion economy, and we're beginning to see this reverse. Now we're going to come on to some of the tensions that we're seeing in the world today. But as I said in my first statement, a lot of companies are looking to have that China plus one manufacturing base in Asia. Now, that was always the plan. It so happened that China worked so incredibly well that a lot of companies forgot the plus one. They've suddenly been reminded of that very quickly, both by the, the trade tensions, by the very substantial rise in wage costs that we've seen in China, which is obviously underpins why China has done so well. Uh, and as well by the virus. People have seen that supply chains can't be as concentrated in one country. We're seeing some elements of reshoring back to developed markets, but we're also seeing people beginning to look at these very exciting countries across ASEAN uh, as a, a potential manufacturing source. As people get richer, people want to satisfy their needs first. If you wash your hair with it, if you brush your teeth with it, if you eat it, if you need better education, better health care for your children. So as you start to see GDP per capita move from that 1000 to $5,000 range. That's when you really begin to see the consumer staples companies move. And we've got some good examples in ASEAN over the last couple of years. You know, we call it the well-trodden path as, as you make that transition up the GDP per capita line. And you know, it's interesting to note, of course, that China's been through that stage. China had that golden age of, of the 5,000 to 10,000 per capita GDP. The 20, 2005 to kind of 2016 was the really golden age. ASEAN was there ahead of China, and it's now accelerating into that golden age. Uh, and so if I give you a couple of examples, we talked about Smashburger. You know, Jollibee, when I first met them in the early 2000s, this is a quick service restaurant. This is the eponymous food chain for the Filipinos. It had about 560 million of revenues in 2015 with 600 stores. That today is a $3 billion revenue line and a 3,500 restaurants globally, very concentrated in China, Vietnam, Thailand, obviously America, Smashburger. But the market cap went from a billion to seven billion, a huge re-rate of consumer. People love the emerging market consumer story. But you know, ASEAN in the last five, six years has really been out of favor, and that market cap has fallen back to three billion. You know, the consumer across ASEAN has really been like the consumer across most of EM, in fact, most of the world. As you get richer, you can satisfy your, your wants. We'll come on later as to how wants become needs as we move into the discretionary income. But hopefully that gives you a flavor of, forgive the pun, gives you a flavor of how the EM consumer has been kind of mimicked by its growth in ASEAN. All right, you hit an income, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about geography and, and whether whether you reside in a city or out in some rural area impacts this. You're seeing urbanization. I mean, that's undoubtedly one of the key things is you do begin to drive the agrarian uh, revolution in these markets down as you begin to reduce the kind of dependence on, on large families, you begin to have a, a smaller family uh, construct as you have lower birth rates, you begin to drive urbanization. As you drive employment in factories versus farms, that again drives urbanization. So we are seeing the rise of the big urban conurbation. Uh, anyone who's tried to get around Jakarta, for example, would know that the traffic is pretty awful. And so motorbikes are very useful. So we are seeing there are different challenges definitely in, in Southeast Asia. You say Indonesia is an archipelago of several thousand islands. And to, to, to have a distribution network that fits that geography is very important. So we are seeing that it's not going to be the same as in China or the same as in India. But the urbanization and the growth of large scale cities is definitely going to enable those elements of the urban area to do well. 
Um, and we're seeing that in terms of when we get onto e-commerce, we'll see how e-commerce is currently dominated by the urban centers, where urban centers might be about 15 to 20 percent of populations, but actually they're more like 50, 60 percent today of, of e-commerce activity. But we are seeing that the supply chains are improving. We are seeing the increase of infrastructure. Obviously, infrastructure spend is one of the most important ways that emerging markets do drive their ability to grow. You need to have cement roads and bridges and railways and airports. And that's a key part of the whole evolution of emerging markets. Uh, And as we see those do improve, we see the ability for supply chains to improve with them. So it's a long-term story, but we've definitely seen the first signs of it working in, in ASEAN. Yeah, as you said, if you go to Singapore today, the skyline could be anywhere. But similarly, if you go to, to, to Ho Chi Minh, you go to Thailand, you know, these are pretty incredible skylines now. And especially if you had told me in 97, 98, post the Asian crisis, that you were going to see skylines of this magnitude and this wealth, uh, I don't think many of us would have really believed it. So 2020 has all been about tech, 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 tech. Is there any tech industry in the ASEAN countries or are they just merely using U.S. or China technology? Well, it's a great question. And I think obviously one of the key aspects is because, as you say, the Chinese influence on markets and global economies has been so strong recently. Uh, And the rise, obviously, in the last six months or so of working from home, you've had this huge concentration into the technology food chain. And historically, that's always been a North Asian part of of the economy since really you you, you saw China, Taiwan and Korea take on the mantle of what really was a, a Malaysian Singapore hard drive industry, as we said earlier. Um, but you know, as you do begin to drive um, penetration of, of technology and smartphones and the internet, it's incredibly important to, to remember that you know, that then enables you, rather like your consumption of toothpaste or beer or, um, or, or medicine, you want to access the same things. I, I famously, I remember I was uh, in quite a, a remote location in Indonesia, and I was just talking to, to one of the the staff in, in the bank that we were meeting. And they said, listen, really all I want in life is I want to have a Spotify account, I want to have a Netflix account, and I want to have an Apple or iPhone. So if people's requirements or, or needs are pretty universal these days. So there's an element that obviously we're not expecting to find the latest Indonesian smartphone manufacturer to take on Apple. But we do think that there's very important ways that these things have to be localized. Um, and so we are seeing a dramatic shift towards technology. If I put it into context, and this is on mobile subscribers, which obviously people have more than one SIM card, but you know, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, is already the third largest user of mobile uh, subscriptions globally at about 900 million. So obviously, yeah, that's one and a half SIM cards per person. But importantly, it's also going to be the third largest internet usage pool within the next couple of years. So it will exceed North America quite soon. So there's a lot of people who are online. The, the rise of the cheap smartphone is delivering the ability for people to do all the things that we'd expect to do. Now, having said that, as to your point earlier about infrastructure and and the concentration of people, the internet economy is relatively limited so far in Southeast Asia. GMV in in ASEAN was $5 billion in 2015. Today, it's $38 billion. So we've seen pretty substantial growth already. It's expected to grow another four times uh, over the next six years. It should hit $150 billion in 2025. But you know, these are very small numbers relative to what we're seeing in, in some of the, emer- the bigger emerging markets. So we're seeing today, for example, maybe 25 to 3% of GDP is currently transacted as GMV. That number is more like 25% in China. That number is more like 15 16% in the US. So there's a huge amount of room to grow. And that does mean that as yet, we haven't yet seen who the winners are going to be. You talk about, you know, obviously, what we're really here to talk about, stock markets. You know, there is one current listing, which a company that listed about two years ago called C, obviously very well named for Southeast Asia. And that's done incredibly well. I mean, this is a stock that's gone from from $10 just post the IPO to being a $140 stock um, in the last 12 months. Now, a lot of that has been because of the, the scarcity value. It is the only listed Southeast Asian technology stock. It's got very good parentage. Tencent is the ultimate parent. So that's been an incredibly strong beneficiary. And so to your point, we are seeing a lot of Chinese internet giants dominance coming through by them, in effect, funding a huge amount of potential applications across Southeast Asia. But there have been some very interesting domestically launched ones. So people like Gojek, Grab, these are two of the big kind of Indonesian, Singaporean unlisted companies. Now, again, we've seen Alibaba obviously come in to fund some of them. Um, but you know, these are amazing, exciting future companies. Lazada, 
Chocopedia, both online shopping, e-commerce companies, um, Traveloka, Bukalapa. I mean, there's a lot of exciting new companies coming through. At the moment, we've only got one really to focus on, the listed element of C. And you know, it's done incredibly well. It's now a $70 billion market cap with no EBITDA. So you know, whatever valuation metric you're trying to apply to it, you're having to look for some EBITDA in 2022. So we think it's probably done very well or well enough, possibly. But again, if you look back at that, that well-trodden path and the golden age, in many ways, you, you, we talk about the well-trodden path. We talk about history rhyming. Uh, if you just think back briefly as to the evolution of income. So if ASEAN incomes today are around $6,000, that's where Chinese incomes were in 2007. So that's an 11-year gap. Chinese incomes today are where Korean incomes were in 1990. That's a 28-year gap. And Korean incomes are where Japanese incomes were. So we know what's going to happen. So we think that that GMV penetration that we talked about is very likely to continue. That e-commerce penetration continues to pick up. So there's a huge amount of activity to be done. We've talked about e-commerce, you know, online fashion is an incredibly big part of the market, which is at even lower levels of penetration. And I don't suppose we can really talk about fintech or e-commerce without talking about the, the latest big IPO, which is Ant Financial. Now, we've been lucky enough to have Ant Financial as a kind of co-investor or the big investor in a couple of our frontier investments across Southeast Asia. So they bought into a Myanmar business called Wave Money. Uh, not strictly in ASEAN, but in Bangladesh. Bcash has had a, a very interesting involvement from Ant. And obviously, we're now getting Ant listing on the public market. So your fintech is incredibly exciting. And we've long talked about the thematic of digital inclusion. It's much harder to persuade someone, as you say, in rural Indonesia or rural Myanmar to go, go into town and set up a bank account. But if you've got a 2G now or even a 3G smartphone, and you have the ability to have a mobile wallet, the ability to drive Digital inclusion and financial inclusion is dramatic. And as we've seen with the, the numbers, the returns on investment are enormous too. So e-commerce is coming in Southeast Asia. We have bits and pieces. The scarcity value obviously has driven valuations up at, at where we have. But you know, I would really expect this to be a very dramatic part of the markets over the next 10 years. And just to put it in context, you know, today, technology as it is, is about 2% of Southeast Asia's market cap. You know, that's where China was. 10, 15 years ago, China today is about 20%. And again, the US, which was you know, at about 20% 10 years ago, is now at about 40%. So we know tech is here to stay. We know that the events of the last six months have only made that even more obvious. You know, we think that the future for Southeast Asian tech is incredibly bright. You mentioned earlier the ASEAN area was one of the earlier uh, areas for offshoring. So as the U.S. decouples from China, is there an opportunity for this region to absorb some of this back? What can they do? What can't they do? Do they have the infrastructure that is required? Great question. And again, it comes back to the point that you know, China was so successful uh, and the China plus one was forgotten about. It became China was the, the be all and end all. And as you say, supply chains are incredibly complicated and they need to have a long tenure. Um, having said that, there's an incredibly important element to to costs. You know, Chinese costs over the last 10 years have risen very dramatically. So regardless of whether you're going to see increased tensions geopolitically between China and the US, there was a good reason for people beginning, even as I said in 2019, to begin to look to want to relocate, because this is the age-old question of labor versus capital. And so, you know, Chinese costs now are, are something around the times of three or four times more expensive than Vietnam, or maybe seven times more expensive than Bangladesh or Pakistan. It's an important question. And, and the other thing to remember is demographics. You know, the median age of the 650 million population of ASEAN is about 30. You know, China is going to get old pretty quickly. We, we face a fairly strong demographic situation. So in 2000, there was an enormous amount of the Chinese rural population that wanted to move to the eastern seaboard, to the, the Pearl River Delta, and wanted jobs. You know, 20 years on, that workforce is getting older. We're getting to a stage now where China, really with a one-child one policy, you know, China is getting to a stage where its workforce is aging. And where else do you have that concentration of expertise? Where else do you have that concentration of educated, literate workforce outside of Asia? Well, yes, we've seen some Mexico. We're seeing Mexico beginning to take some, some of its um, business back. Obviously, there's hopes for Brazil. Africa, obviously, my uh, other beloved part of the world. You know, that's where you're seeing population growth of 1.2, possibly to 3 billion. And could Africa be the next manufacturing 
um, miracle. Who knows? But it still looks as though that the low cost manufacturing labor costs that you can drive in ASEAN will be there. Now, let's just put some numbers on it as well. So Chinese exports to the US are $550 trillion and ASEAN exports to, to the US are $185 trillion. So even a 10% decline in, in Chinese exports to the US, which all went to ASEAN, is a 30% hit hike. Let's think about manufacturing. The US manufacturing industry says $2.3 trillion. Chinese manufacturing is $4 trillion. Now, if you add up, you know, it's about 28% of the world's manufacturing is now fo focused in China. The largest ASEAN uh, manufacturing industry is in Indonesia, obviously by virtue of the fact it's $1.1 uh, $1 trillion GDP, and that's only $200 billion. Thailand's at 135, Malaysia's at 80 billion, Singapore's at 60, Vietnam's only at 45 billion. So $4 trillion, 1% comes out of China, that doubles Vietnamese exports. In no way am I saying that there's any chance that the world can untangle itself from China, even if we're all towed to tomorrow. And I think we'll come on to the tensions, but one of the key things is the world is far too mutually interdependent on the relationship between the DM consumer and the Chinese production line, and ultimately as well, the Chinese consumer today, if you look at the percentage of sales for the US semiconductor industry or US hardware into China, the vast likelihood is you can't untangle it. But for Southeast Asia in particular, just a tiny amount of, of FDI that decides to leave China and decides to enter ASEAN is huge. Now, let's just put it in Samsung used to have a lot of handset manufacturing in China. I visited the, the Samsung factories outside Suzhou many years ago. They now have zero manufacturing of handsets in China, and they've relocated all of it to Vietnam. So 50% of their handset manufacturing is now out of Vietnam. Vietnam is really attracting a huge amount of inbound Japanese, Korean, and Chinese FDI, and increasingly European and US FDI. So you know, Vietnam does sit in that sweet spot where the ASEAN Tigers were in the, in the 80s and China was in, in the 2000s. So Samsung has proved that it can be done. You're also beginning to see a pickup in, in Thai, Malaysian, low-cost tech manufacturing. There are companies out there that, again, I met in the late 90s, which have carried on doing what they were doing, very much overshadowed by the rise of, of China. But you know, you've still got you know, electrical ma ma machinery, you've still got printed circuit boards, you've still got a lot of the semiconductor supply chain. And I think you know, that can come back. But you know, it's important, as you say, to think that not all of that $4 trillion is going to leave China. China's got an enormous domestic market that it wants to feed. Um, but just a small fraction of that has a huge impact on driving FDI to ASEAN. And of course, what does that mean? That means jobs. That means urbanization. That means increases in consumer expenditure, which comes back to those companies we were talking about earlier. So will this region be stuck in the middle as these two superpowers battle it out? Given the, the geographic location, are they closer to the U.S. or closer to China? I mean, here in the U.S., is we, we can decouple somewhat, and although it's going to be difficult. We don't share an ocean. We don't share borders. How can they do this? How can they walk that line? Probably the most important question globally, both for geopolitics and for stock markets today, is to the future of the U.S.-China relationship. And it's obviously one that we spend a lot of time at RWC discussing, and, and as you know, we have the, the help of Rice Hadley Gates Consultancy. It does appear that, as you say, China's decided to take a more expansionist role. They spend a huge amount of money on their military, as you say. ASEAN does, does has a role to play in kind of balancing between the superpower, the two superpowers' influence. Um, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of surveys done. Broadly, half of ASEAN tends to side with the US. So, you know, Vietnam, the Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia have kind of historically tilted towards the US. And then you found countries like Myanmar, Brunei, Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, maybe have had more Chinese uh, influences. But there definitely does appear to be a requirement and an understanding from the ASEAN leadership that it's not in their interest to pick sides. You know, they really have to make sure that the status quo as such remains and they will be a big beneficiary of the status quo. But obviously, they do need to be very aware. Um, obviously, the Taiwanese question has been asked more and more, especially after the recent events in Hong Kong. So I'd say you know, it's definitely a very important choice. Pragmatically, it looks as though both countries will always get to the edge of a, of a sharp detention and ultimately yeah, is in neither country's interest for this to really bubble up too much. Obviously, there's a huge amount of politics coming up to the US elections over the, the next two months. But you know, as, you, as you say, for ASEAN, it's incredibly important 
the, the status quo continues. I think one of the interesting things is obviously the One Belt, One Road initiative. You know, we, we've seen many, you know, a lot of people thought this was a new, a new event in, in geopolitics. We've seen hundreds over the last 2,000 years, hundreds of such events where excess capital and excess savings has had to be redeployed from the current winner of the global economic environment into excess, excess savings leading to investments elsewhere. You know, we talked about you know, the rise of Japan and Korea post the Second World War, and then obviously the Japanese capital that was kind of very liberally spread out about the world in the 80s. So China's very big, bold announcement of One Belt, One Road is obviously an incredibly important geopolitical event. But you know, it's nothing we haven't seen before, and obviously I don't think, I think we will see again. It's obviously begun to pull back a little bit in terms of the overwhelming na- nature of, of the headlines. Some countries have pulled back from wanting to have too much Chinese influence not just in Africa, but you know, in, in other parts of Southeast Asia, which comes back to the balancing impact. But it is an important part of what, of what China is trying to do. And remembering you know, the, the geography of, of where we are, you know, the Malacca Straits has long been seen as one of the weak points of China's economic survival. That's where the vast bulk of their oil supply comes through. Uh, and so you do get you know, interesting ideas, you know, rather like the Panama Canal you know, over 100 years ago, we're talking about a canal across Thailand. We're talking about a road bridge across Malaysia. So we'll continue to have a lot of these interesting big infrastructure ideas because that, again, does re- highlight one of the weak spots of China. But overall, we do think the co- economic necessities of life. We know that China, as much as any other economy, has to deliver prosperity and welfare and jobs. And that's one of the most important ways to keep governments in power. And in that respect, you know, we don't think that the situation in the South China Seas is really going to be too much of a tinderbox. But it's an incredibly important thing we need to watch. What is the impact of COVID? I think of many of these countries as being great places for tourism and travel. So as you say, I mean, North Asia, China, Taiwan, Korea had a relatively difficult period early Q1 and got through. It's interesting to note that in line with much of the world, the vast bulk of Asia will see between minus five and minus 15 Q2 GDP declines. The one standout is Vietnam, which is probably going to be positive even in Q2, and will still report maybe positive four for 2020. We've seen that you know, Chinese exports have recovered because of the restocking that we needed across the world. We're seeing similar in Vietnam. You know, Vietnam is an important part of the restocking, uh, as we've seen inventories come down globally. But you're right. I mean, this has been a very difficult period for many of the ASEAN markets. Obviously, some of the bigger, more developed markets, such as Singapore, have, have locked down incredibly hard and incredibly fast and had very few instances of the virus. And therefore, the governments can reopen those markets pretty quickly. We've spent a lot of time looking at the stringency index in terms of how hard you lock down. And really, the Philippines and Indonesia stand out as been having quite hard lockdowns in urban areas because of the weakness of their health systems, which, which we can come back to. One of the key points, as you say, is tourism and travel. Now, tourism and travel was a very important theme for us. You know, the growth of the Chinese tourist mimics what happened to the growth of the Japanese tourist in the last 20 years. For many years, we've had a strong China tourism theme. Only one in 10 Chinese people still have a passport. You know, the growth rates were still very strong. Um, and Thailand, as you say, is you know, an incredibly important tourism story. Thailand has grown tourists from, I suppose, the early 90s when I first went there to at a level around four or five million. It hit 10 million in, in 2010, and it's going to hit 40 million in 2020 until the virus hit. Now, we always knew that the vast bulk of the countries that, that we're talking about had a strong tourism element. I mean, you think about you know, the big EMs, China, Korea, Taiwan, India, Brazil, Russia. Tourism is important. It's nice. It's not what you associate with those countries if I say those names to you. If I say Thailand or Indonesia or the Philippines or, or maybe Myanmar, Vietnam, you immediately associate beautiful beaches and, and a wonderful holiday. And unfortunately, we'd never expected, and, and this is kind of, I suppose, mayor culpa on our point, that, that tourism would go to zero, that you did suddenly have tourism and travel virtually hit zero, which has been obviously an incredibly devastating impact. Now, having said that, there are a couple of mitigating factors. The governments in many of these countries have done incredible things with moratoriums. Um, they've been very quick to support their, their tourist industries and domestic tourism. As you've had this increase in domestic wealth, 
actually domestic tourism has kicked in. So obviously it's not nearly enough to fill the hole left by, by global tourists, but it has made an impact. In Vietnam, we've seen a huge pickup in domestic tourism. Vietnam reported zero deaths from the virus until about last month when they picked up very mildly. But you know, we have seen that this return of domestic tourism or this increase in domestic tourism. And so you know, that very sharp hit that tourism has had, when you do have from 17% of GDP in Thailand down to kind of 12% Vietnam, 12% in the Philippines, yes, it's been dramatic. And you know, bringing markets into it, you know, that is why ASEAN is still down nearly 20% for the year in dollars. Yes. This has been one of the biggest headwinds um, which none of us ever expected. You know, we always thought it was a lovely tailwind to GDP. And that's why you've seen this huge deviation in performance, because North Asia is very much tech, tech hardware, and had very little GDP impact from tourism. Whereas if you look at the, the, the big ASEAN markets, a huge amount of them have a huge impact from tourism. You know, that obviously, for me, makes me incredibly excited for 2021. You know, the whiff of a vaccine or the whiff of the world kind of beginning to understand the complexities and the death rates and the mortalities of, of what the virus actually has impacted. Yeah, you know, I went on a holiday to Greece. I mean, I'm not going to get on a plane to Thailand yet, but you know, Greece is beginning to reopen. Wearing a mask on a plane was a bit different. But you know, we saw it with SARS and tourism was massively affected. But people want to go on holiday. People want to relax. And you know, we do think that the virus will be under control. I'm not saying there's a we're going back to normal, but the new normal will still involve beaches and hopefully sitting in the sun and relaxing. So ASEAN is a big tourism. We had 133 million tourists to ASEAN, and I would expect that to recover and more 21, 21, 22, 23. But again, I don't think globally we anticipate this. Globally, tourism and travel is 12% of global GDP. We've all seen the reaction from the oil price as a result of this. So it's interesting to see that ASEAN is one of the worst affected parts of the global economy. But obviously, that gives us great excitement for, for when the recovery comes. Kind of related to, to COVID, uh, healthcare has become a bigger focus because of the pandemic. What does the healthcare landscape look like in these countries? Very dependent on which bit of ASEAN we're talking, because parts of ASEAN are incredibly sophisticated. I lived in Singapore for 10 years. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ASEAN believer. I lived, worked, traveled there. And Singapore medical tourism became a huge part of the country's DNA, uh, it obviously it's a relatively small population set, but as you began to attract incredibly high caste healthcare companies, as you began to develop a very strong domestic doctor base, as you begin to look at the, you know, the, the concentration of doctors and nurses, the beds per thousand, you know, Singapore now looks like a, a, any developed market, if not better. So you know, the Singapore medical system is, is world class. Obviously, as you then would expect, Thailand and Malaysia being that much higher up the GDP per capita chain, you know, there's been very interesting case studies. You know, again, much as, as, as travel and tourism is a strong theme for us, healthcare is a hugely important theme. Again, as you get richer, one of the first things you want to do is you want to have better healthcare, better medical treatment. You want your government to provide hospitals and doctors, and you want to be able to access them and have better access to pharmaceuticals. So this is a very natural event to your question earlier. What does the consumer do? So Bangkok Dusit has grown from a billion dollar market cap, it hit 14 billion, it's obviously pulled back to about $10 billion. Uh, and over that 15 year period, revenues have gone from 400 million to over $2 billion. Now, medical tourism is an incredibly important feature, especially with the decline or, or the, the huge imposition of healthcare costs on European, dare I call them socialist governments. And I, I do live in Europe, so I think I can say that. And you look at the US, where 20% of GDP is healthcare, so the world is crying out the developed market consumer is crying out for a cheaper procedure for a hip uh, or for plastic surgery than they can get elsewhere. So you have this enormous rise in medical tourism to Thailand. You know, we're better to go to have a cheaper hip operation and then sit on a beach for two weeks. So you know, that drove an incredible part of Thailand's um, medical infrastructure. But at the same time, you had the development of the domestic base. You had a richer population who wanted hospitals. IHH, a big medical business in, in Malaysia, again, $11 billion market cap with very exciting international operations in countries like Turkey and India. The interesting element, obviously, they're more developed, they're more expensive. You know, you've, you've seen a big part of the market cap growth. But you look at countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, where they've had to have more stricter lockdowns because they have a more um, embryonic healthcare system where you do have 
fewer doctors per capita, you have fewer nurses per capita. And that's where we see huge upside. And we, we have uh, exciting investments across some of the Indonesian hospital stocks, you know, where you do have this move from the government to provide national insurance, healthcare, and effect. Uh, you've moved people onto the kind of national system of uh, pay insurance versus pay as you go. And that's always associated historically with a big pickup in, uh, in admissions. And so we do see some incredibly exciting opportunities, again, in those kind of earlier stage per capita GDP parts of, of ASEAN. Similarly with pharmaceuticals, there are some you know, very exciting opportunities. And overall, the growth of, of nutritional awareness. You know, we are beginning to see people want you know, in increasingly access to different types of nutrition, maybe plant-based meals. Uh, we're looking for food additions. We're looking for you know, you know, Chinese traditional medicine is coming through. So there's very exciting elements across healthcare. And that's always been a very important part of our process. Vietnam seemed to be, I don't know, the, the area's market darling over the last few years. Does that still hold today? I mean, are there any, any uh, liquidity issues or any restrictions on, on foreign investment that people should be aware of? Well, it's undoubtedly, from a macro perspective, one of the most exciting stories we've seen for a long time, uh, for all the talked about. But obviously, as you know, stock markets don't always reflect macro, it can get priced in pretty quickly. So we had a situation in early 2018 where Vietnam really had a spectacular move. So if you remember the history of, of Vietnam, its first big capital market explosion was really the 2007-2008 boom when, when all emerging markets had this amazing liquidity rush. That continued really longer in Vietnam. The, the bubble didn't burst until 2011. You had a very difficult period, 11 to 16. And then the central bank did the right things about controlling the dong. You reduced inflation. You managed to get long-term inflation and interest rates under control. And it began to move. Now, as you say, one of the problems with small emerging markets, frontier markets, is there can be an awful lot of capital that tries to get in in a very short amount of time to reflect future long-term growth. And obviously, one of the things we focus on most is valuations combined with FX, combined with the top-down perspective. And you know, Vietnam had a, an enormous, dare I call it, a bubble in Q118, from which it hasn't yet really recovered. The great joy about these smaller emerging markets, frontier markets, is that what we see today is not what you're going to see in 20 years' time. IPOs, capital raisings, this is an incredibly important part of the stock market evolution of emerging markets. You know, I still remember the IPO of Tencent. It really was Tencent. And if I'd held it forever, I wouldn't be sitting here today. But we know that the capital evolution, the broadening of the capital structure. And so we like Thailand a lot. We're not particularly big fans of some of the biggest listed names in Thailand today. Um, we think that they're quite crowded. We think they're quite expensive. We think, dare I call it, the tourist trap. You get a lot of people who want to think that they're in Vietnam and maybe don't have the bottom-up expertise, the number of analysts that we have, and, and just buy something that's got Vietnam and a consumer name in the title. We do think there's some great stories in infrastructure. I think you know, a couple of the steel stocks looking very exciting. We're still big believers in physical retail. We talked a lot about e-commerce, but you know, in, in Southeast Asia, physical retail, the development of shopping centers is still an incredibly important part of development. So we do see Vietnam at a very early stage in terms of the formalization of retail. And there's some exciting you know, thematics that we follow from elsewhere. We talked about pharmaceuticals. The penetration of the auto industry, uh, scooters to, to four-wheelers is very important. So we, we think Vietnam is an incredibly exciting part of, of our portfolio. Obviously, it's a much bigger part of our frontier market portfolios than it is of our emerging market portfolios for, for those reasons that you say. But today, you know, the market is about a $200 billion stock market. You know, it's down from its peak. That still puts it on about 60% market cap to GDP. As I said earlier, and we can go into more detail, but you know, the ASEAN markets have performed pretty poorly for the last 10 years. But definitely Vietnam, we think, is one of the most exciting going forward. Um, but we do think you need to have very good bottom-up information to find the, the real long-term winners, not the winners of the last five years. Yeah, but, but aren't, there, aren't there liquidity issues? I, again, I mean, unfortunately, this comes back slightly to the predicament that we find um, emerging markets in. And the frontier markets were very popular in the, the period post the EM rally, if you think back to, to how EM worked, really, there have been three great phases of the EM rally over the last 30 years. One was in the run up to 97. Then you had the 02 to 08 rally. And then you had that very sharp rally post the financial crisis. But you know, EM as a broad index is pretty flat over the last 10, 12 years. 
And obviously within that, you've had huge winners out of the Chinese internet, some of the North Asian names, but it's been quite polarized where the success has come from. Frontier took off late 2011, 2012. But if I just give you some brief numbers, it, it, I think it explains quite a lot how difficult Vietnam has been. You know, there was $60 billion of Frontier money in 2014. Now, if you imagine 10% of that, for example, was in Vietnam, that was $6 billion of foreign money in Vietnam. Now, because the index has changed and we've had various additions and exclusions, but overall, let's just say Frontier funds have gone to 20% in Vietnam, which is kind of roughly where, where we would be. Unfortunately, Frontier AUM has dropped to $5 billion. So that's a, you know, a spectacular 90% decline, which the bulk of it is, is actually redemptions, not, not market moves. So you know, 20% of $5 billion is only a $1 billion. So if you think about it, you know, foreigners have been forced sellers of $5 billion of Vietnamese equities over the last three years in a market that might trade to $220 million a year. Now, that leads on to an, a, an amazingly good point, which you know, I'm very glad you brought up. What do we really look for in a, in a market? We, what we really want in a market is a country that can drive its own capital requirements. You know, we spend a lot of time pontificating about international flows of money. But in reality, the success of Japan, the success of Korea, once you've had the initial FDI to get it back on its feet, the vast bulk of the capital required is internally generated. Because what we're really trying to achieve is have governments in place that when you earn your first peso, rupiah, ringgit, you don't buy a dollar. And obviously, the problem that Asia faced in 97, 98, when you had that spectacular implosion of the economies driven by fixed exchange rates falling anywhere from here. The Indonesian rupee fell from 2,000 to the dollar to 18,000 to the dollar in a very short period of time. But as you begin to have very stable economic backdrops, so 1998 really set ASEAN up and, and Asia up for this long-term uh, success period, you, that leads to the creation of domestic pension funds. You want people to have a Chilean, Australian-style pension fund industry where you are forced to contribute monthly so that you have your assets and liabilities matched, unlike in countries like Europe or Italy or the UK, where you have huge unfunded pension fund liabilities. And what does that achieve? That achieves ultimately a very substantial amount of domestic capital that allocates between fixed income and equities on a monthly basis. And Vietnam wasn't big enough to absorb that. Vietnam's domestic pension fund industry, unlike Malaysia's or unlike the beginning signs that were seen in places like Thailand, just wasn't big enough. So that partly created you know, the collapse of the bubble in Vietnam. As I say, as you begin to see the creation of these domestic pension fund pots, as I say, you know, Singapore's now got 80% of GDP is in pension funds. Malaysia's at 60%. Malaysia's a market that we like it from a macro perspective, but it's often hard to find stocks that hit our growth at a reasonable price valuation just because the nature of, of the pension fund industry means you've got a constant bid coming in from local money. So that's what we like. We like countries where they're going to buy their own market, you know, where you're going to have Robin Hood every day, not just once every 10 years. So you know, the Philippines is low, Vietnam is very low. So that's what kind of partly offset Vietnam. But again, it, it comes to the point that you know, Tencent is a $700 billion company. You know, Tencent is a company that, that is up there with an Apple and a Microsoft and can give you infinite liquidity. You will not find infinite liquidity in Vietnam. And, and in reality, these days, you won't find infinite liquidity in places like Indonesia or even in Thailand. Thailand will turn over $1.8 billion a day, but that's still you know, a fifth of what Tencent can turn over on a bad day. And relative to China, it's, you know, it's, it's a mere fraction. You know, Southeast Asia, because of the underperformance and because of the retreat of indices, it, it has become a less liquid part of the universe. Political instability and, and currency instability kind of go hand in hand. Any countries we need to be watching closer? Well, I talk about political stability from the UK it seems a bit of a, a difficult, it's difficult for me to be objective. <laughs> one of the reasons I did emerging markets and so one of the reasons that people pushed emerging markets 25 years ago was we believed in the convergence. Now, I think most people thought that emerging markets would converge upwards to the sunny uplands of political probity and corporate governance that the Western democracies displayed. I would argue that possibly the Western democracies have slipped a little and, and we've seen a convergence maybe lower down than we expected. But definitely the convergence, the corporate governance, the ESG standards across emerging markets are infinitely better than they were 30 years ago. But of course, you will always find there is political risk. We watch very carefully for transitions of power, 
we spend a lot of time you know, meeting politicians to understand you know, who has the Lee Kuan Yew vision to drive their country forward. And you can map very closely you know, successful economies and successful markets to successful politicians. You, know, you look back across big EM, countries like Turkey and Russia under the initial five, seven, eight years of strong leadership did very well. The markets did very well as strong leaders put in place the right economics. But oftentimes in, in some of these countries, the, the leaders have stayed for too long. So it is incredibly important. Thailand has been a, a pretty successful economy and a pretty successful stock market, despite having had, I, don't know, I think it's well over 30 military coups in the last 100 years. And so I think, again, you have to have a fair degree of expertise and, and understanding. You wouldn't want to just start investing in Thai equities from scratch uh, and a military coup takes part and yeah, it's a little bit scary. But you know, on the whole, I think you look at politics today versus 30 years ago, we're in a much better place. You know, the Philippines is a one-term president. President Duterte has been a, a pretty strong leader and has done some very good things and, and arguably not some great things. But on the whole, you know, we haven't we haven't moved away from pure democracy in most of these countries, or at least a, a successful transition of power. You know, Southeast Asia really learned its lesson, as I think did it, Big EM and in particular. Asia in 9798. I mean, that was the last big currency collapse. Now, we don't have an Argentina or a Turkey or a South Africa in Southeast Asia. We have some weak currencies. Indonesia has been a weaker currency uh, over the last 10 years. Arguably, you know, Indonesia has lost kind of 30% of its value in the last 10 years. Uh, and the other bad performing Asia, ASEAN currency has been the ringgit, but purely because they're only commodity driven currencies. You know, Indonesia lost its big coal exports. The coal price collapsed. ESG reasons, coal became less popular. You've had a, a weaker commodity environment since the peak of 12. Oil prices obviously have been much more important for, for the ringgit. Uh, and obviously that big oil price collapse we had in, in late 2014 helped for that. If you look at currencies that were absolutely clobbered in 1997, the Thai bar, the Philippine peso, you know, these, these currencies are actually appreciated. Thailand runs a 6% currency cap surplus. You know, the Singapore dollar is now seen as a store of value. And so you know, it's still very much, you know, we, we apply a very strenuous top-down process. You know, our economists will spend a lot of time looking at fiscal deficits and currency cap deficits and, and looking at terms of trade. But in reality, you know, the ASEAN currencies haven't been as bad as the JP Morgan Emerging Market Currency Index, for example, you know, where you still have had some dangerous, difficult times in countries like Argentina, Turkey, Egypt, for example, where you've had very significant devaluation. So on the whole, foreign reserves are much higher than they've ever been before. You've got much more economically literate central banks who've been given much more independence by politicians. And you, you really built up into kind of pretty mature, stable economy, still on the growth, secular growth path, but with substantially better on central banks. We forecast currencies. We want to avoid currencies when they appear to be too weak, too overvalued. But in reality, the vast bulk of ASEAN is not in the same camp as some of the more volatile EM currencies and frontier currencies that you'd find in South America or Africa. All right. You're selling us on the importance of, of ASEAN. How should investors access this? Is, should it be a standalone allocation or is this something they pick up as part of an EM or frontier broad allocation? What about uh, being uh, more active versus passive in this area? I mean, obviously, that's the, the ultimate question. I mean, I show my age when I say that when I started in, in, in uh, 96, ASEAN was over 30% of the EM index. Thailand and Malaysia alone were about 25% of the index. Obviously, that predates the dramatic rise of North Asia, uh, the emergence of Korea is now the eighth largest economy in the world, Taiwan with its tech industry. They have underperformed, which is part of the reason that they've fallen as, as a percentage of the index. Obviously, the other point is that you've now got, I think, three of the top 10 companies by market cap in the world are now Asian, Tencent, Alibaba, TSMC. And so they've naturally been squeezed as index representation. Uh, we are very index agnostic. We want to buy fantastic companies. And obviously, there have been some phenomenal investments. We, we went through a couple uh, earlier. Um, Bank BCA in Indonesia has grown from a billion-dollar market cap to a $50 billion market cap over the last 20 years. So you know, we do think that there are wonderful opportunities to be had within an emerging market fund. But you know, the way that we 
look at ASEAN within a context of you know, smaller emerging markets and next gen, you know, we have been more overweight the smaller markets historically. Obviously, the way markets have moved in, in 2020 has been more of a tech bias and tech disruption. So our allocation to ASEAN has fallen. But if you think it's only 5% of an EM fund, you know, it's quite easy for us to be overweight. I do think there's a role to be played in funds which have more of a direct exposure um, to, to ASEAN and other small markets. With a, with a small emerging market fund, a next generation fund or a frontier fund, you're going to get bigger exposure. The correlation is less. Presumably, the income growth levels will continue to rise faster. And because of the sheer undervaluation of the last couple of years, you've seen a very dramatic derating. Very much dependent on what the investor is looking for. You know, a good emerging market fund will have a good allocation to ASEAN when it's going up. But you know, we do think there's huge long-term value. We do think there's growth at a reasonable price in, in ASEAN. And you know, we do think it plays a really important role in people's portfolios. Last question. So with a lot of these countries being islands or being countries that are surrounded by water, what's the impact of climate change? And how are they going to pay for some of this? I mean, this obviously has become one of the most important questions globally for all of us to be concerned about. And ESG and climate change is, a, again, a, a very important part of our process. You know, climate change as a theme has become an incredibly part of the, important part of the portfolios. As you say, it is a, a low-lying area. There are you know, very significant flood defences that need to be put on. That will be a very important part of infrastructure. If anyone who, who went to Singapore in the 90s went to the Singapore today and hadn't been there for... 30 years would get a bit of surprise if you're lucky enough to stay in Raffles, which I'm, I'm sure you do, but I don't often get to stay in Raffles. But Raffles is on Beach Road. Well, if you walk out of the front door of Raffles these days in Singapore, the beach is about two miles away. So countries which are rich enough like Singapore have put in pretty solid flood defences. We're seeing that in big metro situations like Manila um, and Jakarta and Ho Chi Minh. Uh, obviously in Indonesia, they're talking about even moving the capital to, to Kalimantan because the risk of Jakarta continuing to sink. But we're talking vast amounts of money. Now, ultimately, you know, that comes back to fiscal probity and the ability of governments to spend and, and borrow. It's an incredibly important part of, of what we're seeing. Obviously, it doesn't just affect Southeast Asia. I mean, you look at the eastern seaboard of, of the US, or you look at the eastern seaboard of, of the UK or China, you know, there's very low-lying parts. I mean, most of the big urban, originally the port system of, of the 18th, 19th century. Again, we come back then to the use of green energy, the dramatic rise of renewables. And you know, I, I go to Vietnam and, and I see dramatic amounts of geothermal, wind, solar panels being put in, you know, the cost-driven down element of, of per kilowatt hour in, in solar and wind. You know, this is now a globally available technology. This isn't just being restricted to developed markets. And obviously, the, you know, the amounts being put in are pretty dramatic. And again, what we're talking about in many ways is the ability of these countries to leapfrog. You know, we, they don't, a lot of these countries don't have to worry about having legacy grids, legacy systems, legacy, you know, rather like we, we, they leapfrog the copper wire networks of the telcos going straight to mobile. You know, a lot of these countries require dramatic increases in electricity production to be able to drive urbanization and industrialization. And if they can be doing that through green energy, you know, again, we go a long way to solving the elephant in the room, which is climate change. So yes, it's an incredibly important part of, of what we do. We do find some exciting opportunities within the green technology space. We do see a huge amount of adoption there is obviously still a, a residual element of, of fossil fuel usage. I mean, China obviously still has significant fossil fuel usage. Indonesia still requires to use coal to produce electricity to a certain extent. And obviously, the world is beginning to, to address that situation through bilateral communications. What we're seeing is market forces really being brought to bear on this now, combined with significant government subsidies and government expenditure. And so we're hopeful, you know, I think as we all have to be, that over time, um, the situation is stabilized, at least. Okay, so the next time you are dining at Red Lobster or enjoying a Red Bull, just remember the importance of these ASEAN countries. James, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great to see you. If you are interested in more information on the topic, please go to our website, where we will have a list of relevant FEG publications. And don't forget to subscribe to our communications at www.feg.com backslash subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.
Please keep in mind that this information is intended to be general education that needs to be framed within the unique risk and return objectives of each client. Therefore, nobody should consider these FEG recommendations. This podcast was prepared by FEG. Neither the information nor any opinion expressed in this podcast constitutes an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy or sell any securities. The views or opinions expressed by guest speakers are solely their own and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of FEG.